and I'm an economist by training, and I've been in this space since the past couple of years. And I was listening to a lot of this stuff, what computer science are talking about, we're going to build these systems in the future, and the business people who are looking to make money from this. And I realized that one of the perspectives that was missing was what are the implications of a variety of these technologies for our economic structures. And you know, economics is front and center in a lot of these discussions and debates where our national economies, our global economy is going. And, and that is really the perspective that I bring in. So my goal here today, and to get the conversation going, and I think Sandy and others did a great job in actually laying the ground for some of this, is to leave you with three key ideas at the intersection of blockchain technology and economics. And it does include AI, by the way, uh, thinking of it. Um, and you know we have a very similar vision uh, with, with Sandy here and the kind of work we do at Connection Science. So let me get started. So like I mentioned, three key ideas. And the first one of that is the impact of increasing connectedness on economic structures. So that's pretty well understood, right? That we, need, we live in increasingly connected worlds, but our economic structures, the way the technology is in place at the moment and the sort of frameworks we essentially work with are in fact archaic. And the entire debate and discussion is essentially about how can we make these systems better? So I think what technology can do and this sort of goes back to 200 years of literature and economics is, first of all, that it can reduce a lot of frictions. And what are those frictions and what all can it address? Well, first of all, information asymmetries. Party A knows something and party B does not. And there is a trusted third party that is required to bridge this gap. But well, guess what? If we do have a shared distributed ledger, then some of these information asymmetries can be addressed. The second thing I want to talk about is the search and transaction cost. Now, usually these are considered a, a minority of the entirety of, of an equation, right? Oh, there are some search costs, there are some transaction costs, but turns out there are entire industries that can be opened up if you can address some of these transaction and search costs. To give you an example, think about Uber. Right? What Uber essentially has done is reduce the search cost of you looking for a driver in the next five minutes of the, that you need the ride uh, so much so that it has opened up an entire different industry and it's disrupting the current taxi industry we have. So, so this is not a small matter. From, again, from an economist's perspective, this is what we call a shock to the system, a black box of innovation that comes in and pushes out our production possibility curve. And so the question is, a lot of this automation can actually happen through smart contracts. Uh, not without a word of caution, of course, if someone forgets to close a variable and someone ships out a few million dollars, that's definitely something to worry about. And that sort of brings us to a more fundamental question as to how can we have these technologies in a safe environment where it is safe to fail. And finally, I think what it does overall is that it reduces systemic risk. Now, what is systemic risk? Well, the financial crisis of 10 years ago is a classic case in point, right? And systemic risk essentially is when too much risk gets concentrated in one part of the system. What's happening is that you don't know what the other party is doing, right? So there's a counterparty risk because we don't have systems that embed trust into them by default. Their actors, entire businesses, entire economies are based on the fact that someone is providing this trust sitting in between. So what it can do is reduce that counterparty risk and allows risk to get dispersed and not concentrated in one part of the system, overall reducing systemic risk. And, and we do know that brought the entire world economy to its knees, and we, we do not want that to happen again. So the question comes here, and we are here, and a lot of people um, who do come to a lot of these conferences talk about the blockchain revolution, quote unquote. And I was thinking about it fundamentally. What are we talking about when we say it is a revolution? And for, to me, I think it is about rethinking value. <laughs> okay. 
All right, so that's just. So what that means is how do we perceive and how do we measure value is fundamentally changing. And it's making us rethink a lot of these things. Now, turns out what that requires and what that entails is networks thinking, where you consider networks as the basic toolbox for your systems and not linear models like general equilibrium in traditional economics. And the, and the reason why that's critical and the reason why we need to take a systemic approach is because the links between these nodes are not the property of any one node. And that is how the system is more than the sum of its parts. Think of it from a complex science perspective, like the financial crisis, right? So you do something that is OK, that's the right thing to do at the micro level. But if everyone does it, if everyone pulls money out of the, the market, then the market crashes. So that is a classic example of emergent properties at, at the system level. So then the question that I want to leave you with is, what kind of economic structures are better suited for this world? And I think that is a sort of brainstorming we have the opportunity to do today. And you know, we wrote this paper um, a couple of months ago along with my co-authors, Jan and Olga, uh, what is the first paper on behavioral economics, supply token valuation. And it really made us take a step back and realize that entire economic, social, cultural systems are, in fact, a vote of confidence, right? In 1973, uh, the US moved to uh, fiat currency and actually said goodbye to gold standards. So, and what that really did, and what the government is essentially saying, is that, believe us, we will provide goods and services the equal end of the face value of this currency note. There's nothing backing it, right? And, and so whatever you look at, at the end of the day, it is the people who perceive that value that lends value to that. And finally, the thought that I want to leave you with, uh, considering that we're talking not just about one technology, but more than one, and I think it chimes very well for, with Sandy's vision here, is that we're witnessing the start of what can be a technological convergence where the future looks fundamentally different from the way we see it now. And it is not just one technology, but a convergence of a host of technologies, including AI, uh, AI assisting humans, by the way, for now, uh, and blockchain serving as the infrastructure technology to base this on that I think uh, is really the promise of the future. So that's it. Thank you very much.